Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books and today I am joined by my good friend Stephen Erickson. Steve, hello! Hi, how are you? I mean, I've never, I've never been on this show before so I'm really delighted to be here. <laughs> I, there are times, Steve, where I, I just want to say I hate you. I, mm. I do. But today we're going to be talking about, I suppose, it, narration, narrative perspective, tying it into narrator point of view, all of those sorts of things, because while we can isolate them, you can, you know, you can talk about first, second and third, uh, first, second and third point person point. as a style of narration. And you can try and isolate it and say, this is just what we're going to talk about. But ultimately, because of what narrative is, because narrative is always the interaction of these things, it brings in other elements. So while point of view, first, second, third person is kind of what we're going to be talking about, I, I imagine, because we haven't mapped this out, we just talk, yeah. I imagine is going to draw in some of the other elements. Yeah, and the reason being, everything is interconnected. You know, if, if you can have your list of terms that are used for narrative structure. Um, but as soon as you start delving into, well, pick any of them, you're going to find how it's related um, quite fundamentally to the other ones. And it, it becomes an entire package. But that's not useful in terms of uh, teaching, say, a, a workshop, because what you need to do is you need to actually isolate these things and then look at them uh, within a very limited context uh, and try not to use all the terminology related to. So, I mean, if we were to talk point of view, how fast do we move into voice and how fast do we move into narrator and how fast do we move into uh, diction levels and how, you know, all these things. I mean, everything, everything feeds everything else. Um, and the challenge for the writer is to make all of those elements of narrative structure uh, mesh in, in a seamless fashion or as seamless as, as possible. And the other thing that I, I think sometimes we overlook is anytime we talk about general concepts or, and some people, you know, the rules of writing. But when we talk about these things as sort of the general concepts and how they are generally used, there are always exceptions because like you've just said there, you, you want these elements to mesh. And yet you and I both know of examples where an element is explicitly being used to stand out because it's being used to contrast with something and that was the narrative intent so it's not meshing with everything else it is deliberately being used in a way to stand out that it's it would be the wrong use of it but because it's been deliberately done to create that effect and that effect is actually what the author was going for in the narrative you suddenly it makes sense so it's I, I yes. sometimes guess Yes, um, but basically, what I mean what I mean in terms of mesh is is as a a block of prose, and so yeah, you can have different peaks and, and valleys uh, within the narrative structure, though that terminology in terms of what you're highlighting, what you're subverting, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the meshing that I'm, I'm actually referring to is the experiential one for the reader. So it's, it's, it's everything's everything put to the reader in such a way that they are immersed in some fashion or another, even if that immersion involves every now and then a, a tug on the reader um, in, a, in an unexpected direction, or the narration turns and, and looks to the reader. It offers a wink or a punch in the face or whatever. Right. So, but it's an experiential thing. And and that's what I think that the writer is hoping to achieve uh, in the process of telling a story. Yeah, um, because, you know, it seems very straightforward. First person is I, you know, and it's someone narrating and it's the I is the narrator. And it's told in that way. It seems very, very straightforward. I walked into the room. I saw a dragon. I punched the dragon in the snout. You go, there you go, very straightforward, I. That's first person. Second person, you. You walked into the room. 
you saw a dragon, you punched the dragon in the snout. You know, their second person narration, done. Um, then we could go to third person. It's Steve walked into the room. Steve saw a dragon. Steve punched the dragon in the snout. And, you know, there you go. Done, dusted. We've just done point of view. Nothing to discuss here. It's all really, really obvious. Except in all three examples you used, there's another element in play, which is past tense. <gasps> oh, did I? Oh, no, 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 no. It's going to affect. It's going to affect point of view, right? The tense you use has an, uh, a direct effect on the structures of the sentences uh, related to the point of view. Yeah. And that is because when people talk about uh, past tense and present tense, we sometimes make the general declaration present tense makes things more immediate because it's meant to be happening as you're reading it. So there's an, um, an assumed sense of immediacy. And past tense is meant to be slightly less tension filled because it is being told in the past tense. It's more passive in some respects. And yet, that's clearly not a universal truth. No, no, and and, and that's that's the other weird thing is is if if you think that the fast rule is uh, you're going to use present tense uh, in order to elevate the the pace uh, and that sense of immediacy, um, you're going to very quickly run into particular problems um and it has to do with sentence structure sentence length um because quite often in order to properly describe an action scene you need a lot of details um if you just in, in a very cursory fashion fashion glance glance over them then the immediacy i think is more confusing than it is actually enlightening so um suddenly you've got an action sequence that has, you know, a, a seven sentence, eight sentence, 10 sentence paragraph, and they're long sentences. And your pace is completely, completely slowed down because you're having to give these details. So it poses, it poses different challenges, uh, each of the points of view that you're going to use and the tenses that are attached to them. And the tenses are always attached to them. Okay, so let, let's start with one form and we'll try and talk through one form and then the, the pros and cons what it's used for why it's used that way its strengths and its weaknesses so which one do you want to start with well i mean let, let's start numerically uh first person now the thing with first person of course is that it is synonymous with narrator whereas the other two are not and we, that's another complication on these things because the narrative the narrator has a particular stance. Now the narrator is not the author. So you have to go once removed again and the author will have a particular stance. And so each one um, is actually affecting the content of what, what's being told in the story. So first person is the simplest because it is synonymous with the narrator. Second person and third person are not synonymous with the narrator. So you have two levels going on there. Okay. So why, why would we pick first person as the narrative position, uh, narrative style for a story? What are the advantages to first person? Um, it limits what the narrator narr narration can achieve uh, in a manageable fashion. So in other words, first person, uh, you can only write down what that character sees, hears, touches, feels, thinks if you want to go internal monologue. Um, and that that narrows the scope of what you have to describe because your first person cannot describe, can, can describe everything in their room, but not in the next room, right? And so uh, that's that's one way of, of, of basically limiting the worldview that you're going to be exploring. And then using that to your advantage because then it, it's great for things like film, or not film noir, but noir uh, in terms of mystery. Uh, you want a, a first person point of view, or you could choose a first person point of view because it feeds well into mystery. Uh, we don't know what's in the next room. We don't know what happened, you know, across the city two days ago that have led up to this moment because it's all first person. So 
uh, I, I guess your Dresden stuff is probably an example of that. I don't know, is it? I um, haven't really well, read it, so I don't know. I'm assuming. Um, and limiting limiting the narrative perspective to that first person, uh, as you say, it closes everything down to the exper uh, experiment. Exper Experiential? Yes. Thank you, Stephen. I am, ha I am having one of those days. The experiential. It closes everything down to what that character is experiencing. Good one. Um, and because of that, it uh, for, I think, a lot of readers, that inspires a level of closeness because the reader is basically inhabiting the entire narrative. So uh, from, from a writer's perspective, as you said, it, it limits what you are describing, what you are doing, because you have set very clear limits that it must be experienced by that character. But yeah, from a yeah. from a reader's perspective, yeah, I know you're going to comment and and no, uh, no, I'm going to say that's the first bit, but num there is a number two. But go ahead. But for that same reason, that same aspect that you're talking about, from a reader's perspective, it is very much encouraging the reader to inhabit that and therefore feel very deeply connected yeah. to that character, to that uh, narrator, to that particular point of view. And so that is a natural strength, I think, of first person uh, in terms of readership, in terms of what it, it gives to the reader. But of course, if that character, if that narrator, if that point of view is doing things that jar very much against what the reader thinks that they should do, that can create a lot of dissonance. And you're constantly then fighting with getting the reader to inhabit that perspective. So I think that's always going to be a tension with it, where you're trying to draw the reader in to experience what this character is experiencing. And then you have to always bear in mind that it is being fed to a reader who is not that person and therefore balance what is true to character, true to the perspective, and what the reader needs and is going to be wanting to experience. Yeah, it's, I would call it a dangerous seduction um, because what you're doing with using the, the eye is, as you say, um, you're inviting the reader to inhabit the character, but it's, it's more than that. The reader is the character. And so the internal monologue, the, the thought processes uh, of that character becomes the clothes and the identity that the reader wears for that story. And of course, the challenge then is you better, well, as you say, it can become uh, problematic because if we are witness to that character's thoughts and actions and words, we may find them reprehensible, in which case we do not want to inhabit. Um, I find it a problematic um, point of view to, to use um, for that particular reason. Uh, you're basically having to make the character's internal logic and internal sense of the world try to conform with as many of your many readers as possible, which kind of dilutes the entire process. And so they end up um, jumping through the hoops in very expected fashions. Um, there are exceptions. There are always exceptions to this. Uh, you know, a very, very skilled writer can can pull the wool over the reader's eyes very uh, deftly with first person. Because first person, I think, people assume you can only use it for certain styles of narrative. Uh, like, as you said, it, it naturally fits with detective noir. It naturally fits with mystery because with both of those things, it's about uncovering things uh, procedurally in a process of uncovering more information until there is the revelation at the end. So the idea of starting with a perspective that is limited in terms of its knowledge and moving through to gain more and more knowledge uh, you can see why first person can fit so naturally with that style of narrative. But I think 
that is too limiting a way to think about it because that's only one aspect of it. Like yeah. first person, if, if you are aware of those strengths and weaknesses, if you are aware of what it can do, then it is a tool that can be utilized, particularly if you have multiple POVs in a work, choosing one of them to relay in first person can then be contrasted against other POVs that are being used that are uh, narrated in a different way. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. I, I did that in uh, The Server Awakens, um, first person, and, and then the other sections were third person. But of course, as soon as we're talking at, to this level for first person, we move into voice because first person succeeds at its best when the voice that the author has stumbled upon or selected is charming in some fashion or another, um, or has wit or has a quirkiness to it, um, uh, or as is, uh, sardonic beyond belief. Um, and an author with the ability to do so, who can actually charm us, um, with that first person, uh, voice is actually much rarer than you would think. It's not an easy thing to pull off. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the best examples um, that I can think of is George MacDonald Fraser's Flashman, who is a reprehensible, horrific, terrible character. Um, and what we're reading are his memoirs, so it's all in first person. Um, but the character is so insanely self-aware of his own, you know, um, uh, his own despicable self that it it becomes absolutely entertaining. Um, and so you just want to keep reading to find out, you know, what, what's the next horrible thing he's going to pull off and how does he get out of the latest scrape? So, but that is, that's now we're, see, we've left, we left point of view behind. Now we're talking voice. But it, it's interesting because you can think of it then as two different styles of even laying aside the question of past tense and present tense, but two very different styles of first person, one with a very distinctive a uh, narrative mm. voice and one that is attempting to be a cipher every, or an empty vessel for the reader to inhabit yeah, every person and, every person yeah um and you can see how they provide radically different experiences and you would deploy them in very very different ways and yet everyone goes oh it's just first person you go it when you say things like it is just almost yeah. almost invariably what you're about to say is, is probably not going to be as accurate as we think it is. No. And, and you can see how when we talk first person, we go to voice and from voice, you go to style. And it just, it just keeps, keeps selecting all of these terms uh, of narrative structure. And they're but, all there for a reason, right? Because they have survived the test of time. And, you know, many others were attempted and have not. And so we don't really, we're not really aware of them. I would suspect that there are some, clear narrative structural elements say in Beowulf uh, or Gilgamesh which have been has have since been or even uh, Homer have, have been discarded and had to be reinterpreted uh, by uh, translation into something more recognizable this is why so many so many versions of Beowulf exist because that that sensibility is being brought to a text that has narrative elements to it that are utterly alien to us and so it's an invitation to oh, okay how, how am i going to interpret this for a modern audience or this generation's uh readership and so yeah narrative structure is it, it's there for a reason for a very good reason uh, that we have in, in the sense that it has what it is what has survived uh through all of storytelling uh, to this point and other things have been cast away. They're just not there anymore. I mean, the, the Greek chorus is gone. You know, the, the soliloquy is gone. Um, things are gone. So. Um, although villains monologuing. Oh, is yeah, still... that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> that's really done for a serious effect, isn't it? <laughs> but okay, well, temporarily putting a pin in first person, then let's move on to second person. Let's outline stuff about second person. So do we have to? <laughs> I really don't like second person. I find it really intrusive, irritating, 
and if, invariably you know when the sentence says something like you walk into you know the the raging building of flames and and, and whatever my response my instinctive response is says no i don't and then i'm broken i'm broken from the narrative but i think the, the we could probably make a distinction between direct second person and indirect second person mm -hmm. um so yeah. it's uh someone is telling a story to someone else and we're listening to it knowing that we're inhabiting we're hearing what that second person is hearing so it's not that we it is being directed that you did it as in you steven erickson mm -hmm. it's more you know it's being said to another character and you're following the events of this and even even then uh, one so of that, the, so, so, so you're calling that indirect right well i'm just saying to try and uh, just use a simple yeah. rather than let's rather than using very technical terms mm -hmm. something direct would be like you walked into the thing but if this if you've set up the the discussion of and you were doing these things and and you get this whole thing where the reader is aware that it's not being directed at them but at a character who they are listening in through that yeah. that i think is is slightly different than being directed at the reader and the reason that the reason i bring this up is when i had the good fortune to be teaching this stuff um for an academic called peter wright at edge hill university who is a brilliant academic uh someone who i greatly admire but peter wright had put choose your own adventure books yeah i was waiting for that um on the syllabus to try and help students understand the power of second person and the power of interactive narrative and the and the the concept of um kernels and satellites and various things about narrative structure and about the appearance of decision making versus what is actually it doesn't matter what you decide you still end mm -hmm. up in the same place yeah. there are a whole lot of different elements of narrative that we were exploring with it but in that the, a lot of those books were very much set up in the idea that the reader, much like a, like almost in the never ending story, the reader has been transported into the mind. Go with this. This is the concept. You have been brought into the mind of this character and you are now in the book. And it was a way of creating, again, a level of immersion that you, and that's where with first person, you're putting yourself in there. As a reader, you're putting yourself behind the eyes. Here it was, no, this is going to be told to you and I'm going to tell you what's happening and then you have to make the decision and engaging the reader that way. So it was a different type of immersion and it was a different way of creating that immersion while still recognizing the artificiality of, well, no, I'm, I'm sitting here reading a book. Yeah, and uh, if one thinks that that's not, you know, choose your own adventure is not popular, well then reconsider the... Uh, wrongly termed first person uh computer game first person shooter first person adventure think of thief think, think of assassin's creed those are all basically aren't they second person you're inhabiting the character that you created and um things happen to you and then you have to make decisions well and so I, even though they call it first person it's not really first person is it well and and within that because then you you have the idea of first person perspective i the the world drops and it, you're just seeing out of the character's eyes Where, yeah. or third person perspective you're sitting outside the character and you can see the character in the environment you know i think that's that's a lot of how people use this instead of thinking of it in terms of because narrative and cinema while there's a lot of overlap between literature and cinema and we talk about narrative because it it branches over both like they're both elements um there are different ways of talking about these things and thinking mm. about these things. And, and as ever, we're trying to explore one concept almost in isolation. And we know there are exceptions and other ways of talking about it because yeah. as ever, it is more complicated than just this one thing. But yeah. if we start with every conversation, well, this is really complicated and just go on a really complex, well, that isn't actually a rule and that doesn't happen because you have it in this thing. It, you can't follow that as let's understand the concept first and then start thinking of variations of it and then think of how it is used. So, so I, I think person? with those codas in place. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can go to third person, I think. Well, one last thing about second person is second there is an intimacy to second person that I think it naturally has, which is it is very evocative of that notion of you sitting with someone you know, and they go, and it is a direct address to the reader. And that is inviting intimacy, not necessarily immersion, but intimacy. And I think that is something that authors uh, and writers play with. Mm -hmm. And when we think of, uh, like, obviously one of the most famous examples of modern literature doing this is N.K. Jemisin's uh, Broken Earth trilogy, in particular the fifth season. And everyone talks about the use of third person in it. Or sorry, the, the use of second person. In it. Yeah. And it is, it is a defining characteristic and Jemison deploys it very, very well. Mm -hmm. And I think part of why it is so successful in that is in part she, she manipulates the second person. So it is an adapted form of third person for a mm -hmm. start but uses it because it is such a personal story that it is inviting intimacy. No, I could be entirely wrong. I, I have not had the opportunity to discuss uh, this work with N.K. Jemison to find out what she thought, but that would be part of what I think about it. Yeah, There's an intimacy to the story that is being told, and that is in part reflected and enhanced by the use of second person. Yeah. Yeah, and it takes great skill to pull off second person, absolutely. Um, because when it goes wrong, it it's it goes really, really wrong very quickly. So well, to to be fair, any of these perspectives can go wrong, and when they go wrong, they can go horrendously wrong. <laughs> but, but but for writers, I mean, it's a good exercise. Uh, you know, if if you've written say a three page scene in something. Um, and you probably, you probably landed on a particular point of view for those three pages and it was an instinctive decision and you went with it. Um, then take that same scene, you know, open up the second file and edit it to be one of the other points of view and then go back and edit it to be the third or well, okay. So say, say you, you instinctively write in third person because most most fiction is third person. And then you go back and you switch to first person to see what happens. You go back and switch it to second person to see what happens. As an exercise um, for the writer, I mean, that's an extremely useful thing to do because you immediately begin begin to see the uh, the advantages to each particular point of view, but taking you in a different direction with those advantages, and then. Um, the disadvantages that are also attached to them. And as a, as a writing exercise, uh, highly, rec highly recommend it. And do it with your own work. Don't, you know, don't, don't pick somebody else's, just what you've written. <clears throat> and then you can do that with tenses as well. Yeah. Past yeah. tense, present tense. And even, even within third person, which obviously we're about to, to talk about, but if you have five characters in a scene, writing the scene even in third person, uh, if you're doing it limited from one point of view, then write the scene again mm -hmm. from one of the other characters' perspectives. Yeah. And as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you inhabit a different character's view of the same scene, you stop thinking of it in the omniscient sort of perspective that we sort of naturally assume of, I know exactly what's going on, that person's going to say that, and then that person's going to say that. If you close in on that limited perspective, to go, well, this is what this person thinks and says. The person across from them doesn't have that interiority. They have a different interiority and they will interpret when you say something forcefully, the other person might think that you said it angrily. Mm -hmm. When you think that you've said something that is very, very clear mm -hmm. and someone then, play, well, this happens all the time. You, you think, well, but I perfectly explained that point. And then you realize you said thing and stuff and you wasn't quite as specific uh, in what I said as how I was thinking about it because I had very clear examples in my head, but I didn't actually mention any of them out loud. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we think we say is not actually what we have said. So looking at it from a different character's point of view can be exceptionally useful for reimagining a scene, 
playing with amb- ambiguity within the scene, making some lines of dialogue more explicit, some less explicit. It's just finding a different way to explore it. Yeah, and, and characters only know what they know. So if you are staying within that particular point of view, um, there's only so much that is accessible to that character. And then that becomes actually advantageous in terms of piecing together a story or rather offering up enough elements through various points of view, various characters, third person points of view um, for the reader to, to make the, to, to make the linkages that are all pre- presented in the narrative, because then the reader knows more than any of the characters knows. And of course that can, that can also, it can be, um, badly done uh you know i mean the classic the classic scenario is you know the party of adventure adventurers who come into the tavern and go up to the tavern keeper who then gives you you know a, a long historical lecture on everything about the entire region and you know the the location of the the door leading into the pits and, and the great treasure down there and the possible you know and the sleeping dragon and all the rest and uh you know you got three days to go and and steal the treasure, and I'll give you a reward. And you're going really? <laughs> it's like this character knows way too much, um, and and there's no internal constraints on, on the character as well, which goes then to characterization. But we'll get to that probably months from now. Well, okay, so let's go back to basics for third person. So we have third person, and then obviously people know about omniscient on one end of the spectrum and sort of limited or close on the other end of the spectrum. And it's not that they are fixed position. Well, they are the extreme positions, but there is movement along between that, that it's not just omniscient or just close or just limited. There's movement along it. And I think that is firstly a distinction that I think needs to be made. (laughs) Because we do, in shorthand, we refer to it omniscient or and it's, we refer to it as an either or, but it's not quite as clear cut as that. So how, how would you describe third person? Well, with third person, you have, you have the, as, as the narrator and the author, um, they're not the same, but even still, you have the choice of, or the freedom to follow any character you want to in terms of the narrative um, advancement of a story. And then you have a secondary choice where you can go into the heads of any character you want to uh, within within the the world you've created and the story you're telling. Um, And in both those instances, I guess you would, well, well, one is omniscient and one is one is limited. Then I would point out that the omniscient, if you, which is something that actually showed up a lot more earlier, uh, not in our latest uh, iteration of of genre or or fiction for that matter. But omniscient third person narration cannot help but point the reader to the narrator. And the narrator can either be present in the story or not in the story. So then you're, once you have to, you know, as a writer, you're thinking, well, okay, the what's the narrator's stake and what's the narrator's position on this particular story? Um, at that point, things start getting complicated because then you have to think of what's the narrator's relationship to the characters within the story and how reliable is the narrator. Um, and in terms of the simplest of the two would be limited. Um, you, you land on the shoulder of the character that you want to be writing about um, and from their point of view. So it's third person, it's limited, but it's not so limited that you, you, you do, you're, you're unable to enter into the head of that character and create a monologue. Um, and of course that monologue is there for the reader. Um, it's not there for the other characters, which sort of creates a, a, a sense of uh, separation. And, but but also creates intimacy in that character because we're getting their internal thoughts, or at least some of them, not all of them, obviously, because that would be incomprehensible, at least from personal experience anyways. So um, 
these are these are sort of third person options um and they tend to be tied to past tense uh, although you can do it in present tense but it, again it, it, it can weird you out as a writer fairly quickly we'll have to talk about tenses some other time yeah but in in terms of third person and that limited perspective in in some respects it's both cinematic because mm -hmm. we're, we're used to in film and television the idea of a camera sitting there usually tied to a narrative perspective of we're following the heroes we see what the heroes see but we're not behind their eyes that we would be in first person well, well only, only sometimes you can be behind their eyes think of the abercrombie thing that you read not long ago about the his sort of waking up on the cliff edge that's his vision but even though it's third person. Yeah. So what I was going to say is a lot of the strengths and, and aspects of third person with that very limited camera is actually, it's very similar to first person mm -hmm. because you are very tied to one perspective and one, and that is limiting the narrative to what that character experiences. And because of that, you can see it's very, very like first person except you're not directly behind their eyes and always only behind their eyes. That it is a yeah. sort of camera fixed on their shoulder that the camera can see things, can see what they see. Yeah. But it's, it's being described almost much more in a way that we see in film and television of following the heroes along in a story. That it's when the heroes arrive at whatever place that we see the place. We don't see the place before they arrive. And so that's part of what I want to talk about there, that third person and first person, why do we regard them as being radically different? Because there's two whole numbers difference between them. Um, actually, in terms of effect, yeah. you can create very similar effects with third person that you can with first person. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of it, I remember um, an exercise that, some of my instructors would, would, would sort of point out while, while uh, workshopping uh, a fellow uh, student's stuff is it, if the point of view is so close in the third person, tight, tight, tight point of view, um, does much change if you change that to first person? And if the question is no, well, then you have to ask, well, okay, well, why am I doing this? Why am I creating this, this little bit of di psychic distance, if you will, mm -hmm. between the narrator and, um, and a point of view. And there may be good reasons for it. And, you know, generally the suggestion would be if there are good reasons for it, be aware of those reasons, right? Uh, reasons why you're doing this. I mean, one of the issues with uh, attempting to do multiple characters from first person, for example, usually requires that each first person I, um, be a distinct chapter and writers have done that right you know a re sort of reportage kind of thing of, of people who have witnessed something or, or experienced something and so you get all these different angles on this particular thing uh, i guess world war z would be an example was that yeah. yeah yeah so and in each in each case there when the writer when the reader comes to the next section the structure has already invited them to understand that this is a different eye but if you were to use I as a first person for multiple characters within a scene, it's, it's, it's probably impossible um, because the reader doesn't know which I you're referring to in any one moment. Uh, I mean, it'd be an interesting challenge. Um, but if you want to be able to view these characters um, with that level of intimacy as if they were first person, then as a narrator you become the omniscient narrator and and you can basically do everything the first person can do but you do it as third person yeah and one of the the interesting things is in when we, we had talked about first person and sometimes when that particular perspective is something that you're worried about inviting that intimacy and immersion by the reader by locating it in a very close third, mm -hmm. you're achieving the same effect, but you're giving the reader that little tiny bit of psychic distance so they can judge 
the character rather than feeling that they have to experience the character or be or be the character yeah, yeah. and so you, i mean i think that's one of the the aspects some sometimes people assume that first person is you know that immediacy that immersion and third person just can't capture that and you go oh yeah it, it can yeah depending on how it's deployed and you can have a very extreme uh, limited third person where you do not have any interiority where you're it's solely the physical uh, experience of the character and then you can move a little bit toward omniscient to dip into the character's head so that's where you're getting your internal thoughts aspects of monologue explanation of emotions and that's usually where we find third person limited in that comfortable range of being able to dip into the point of view character's thoughts. But then you can move further along towards that level of omniscience um, and have, dependent on whether or not you want that omniscient narrator to be visible or invisible, because they can start commenting on mm -hmm. things. And I think, one of the, the things about omniscient narrators that, I, that people sometimes overlook, it's not that the narrator knows everything about everything. The narrator is omniscient because they know everything that happens in the story or everything that happens in the story world. So an omniscient narrator is the one in control of the story. So they can say when a character leaves, if that character is ever going to come back, no matter where they are in the story, that narrator knows where that character ends up they know the end of the story before we get there yeah um yeah. where some narrator, people think that omniscient yeah. means that they know everything it's uh, for example if i tell a story about something that happened to uh, say you and uh, ian cs on if i tell a story about your gaming now i was never there but I've heard the story, I narrativize it, I tell the story, I know where the story is going, I know what's going to end. So in that, uh, in that narrative, I would be an omniscient narrator, even though I don't know what you actually felt when you were experiencing it or what Ian C. Asimov felt when he was in that moment. But in the narrative that I have constructed, I know where it begins, I know where it ends, I know how I am portraying the characters of you and Esselmont. I know all of these things and I'm in control of it. So I am omniscient. Yeah. Even if it is not a true reflection of what accurately happened. <laughs> I know, but that's what complicates things though, because you're using omniscient both as, as narrator and as author. Uh, they've almost blended at that point. Um, but there needs to be a distinction between the two. So, Yes, the narrator has to know. The narrator has to know the entirety of the story, and maybe not the details, but has to know the entirety of the story and can fill in the details ad hoc um, as they go. Um, and because of that, that narrator is outside of time. And so, in creating their story, everything that that is between the beginning of that story and the known ending, um, they can now choose what's relevant. And that's what they will put into the story. The things that are not relevant will not appear in the story. And then of course, you can have an omniscient and yet unreliable narrator because ultimately they all are because the authors are unreliable. So it gets very, very complex, very, very quickly. Well, I that's that's using unreliable in a slightly different way mm -hmm. because of, when we talk about unreliable and reliable narration there are different aspects to it one is level of knowledge uh, and we can say that whether or not they know something um the more that they know the more reliable they are in that sense about levels of knowledge but you also have reliability in terms of trustworthiness mm -hmm. which is a different metric because mm -hmm. a narrator who knows everything you would describe as very reliable they have all of the information they are a reliable source of information but that narrator could be a liar yeah. or could yeah. be telling the story for a particular reason in which case they are unreliable so yeah. one of the easiest ways to distinguish between this 
is the level of subjectivity in terms of knowledge we can describe in terms of reliability and then the level of trustworthiness we could describe that as a second term but at the minute we tend to use unreliable for both and they're not always the same thing because you can have someone who is first person narration is by definition unreliable mm -hmm. because they have incredibly limited knowledge of what is happening in the narrative because they do not know what is happening in the room before they get there mm -hmm. therefore they can walk in and be surprised if they can be surprised they can misinterpret what is in front of them. Therefore, mm. their narration is unreliable. Yeah. However, they could be telling us the absolute truth that what they are narrating is reliable in the sense that it is an accurate depiction of their knowledge of that moment. Or they could be like Severian in Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun, who both lies to the the narratee as well as to himself mm -hmm. and is a compulsive liar mm -hmm. so we don't know whether or not it is an accurate depiction of the events because they are untrustworthy in that sense so mm -hmm. reliability i think is easiest understood as actually being two separate concepts mm -hmm. one the level of knowledge um and the other being the trustworthiness of that knowledge yeah and for me one of the obsessive questions i have as a writer is is reliability that important at all and I, I, it's curious because in, in a meta sense um for the reader to come into a story they they, they have to sign the they sign the contract i mean they can rip it up 10 pages into the story but they sign the contract um, that they are going to be led into this world and they're going to be invited to experience what is occurring in that world. Does that mean that everything that, uh, that is being presented to them is adhering to any kind of objective reality, uh, even the reality set up within the world? Well, no, not really. Um, and that's the thing that is, is, you know, constantly fascinates me in terms of narrative, but that's, that's, that's me. That's my own personal obsessions. So, but but this is one of the like thinking about it from a reader's perspective. I certainly know that when um, when a narrative is written in a particular way, and let's say an author is using a close third person past tense uh, limited perspective, and you go right. So I am limited to what that character can see and hear and experience in the world around them, and then the author has to drop in information to make the scene make sense that that character couldn't possibly have known. Mm -hmm. And I sort of go, well, that breaks immersion for mm -hmm. me. Um, and I look at that and that to me is something that I would isolate as a mistake as there must be a better way to work that information in to fit with the perspective. So understanding narrative point of view these different types of narrator and these different concepts. When I am reading, it allows me to understand what I am following and why when something snags my eye unconsciously, just my eye catch, I'm like, why did I stop here? What, what is it about this that doesn't feel right? Understanding these things sometimes helps me isolate the, the thing that is sticking out on the page. Yeah. And, and I would argue you can do that. You, you can actually break that immersion if you have a, a good reason for it and structurally um and i have done that so you know in fact i did it in, in something i just wrote this week so i'm aware of the, basically what i'm thinking of is if you can give a hint of it at the beginning of the scene or maybe even not at the beginning of the scene but if that break of immersion is not within the events that occurred within that chapter but then comes at the end of it all i think it still works because it, it breaks you but it's you're being broken anyways because it's the end of the chapter so the immersion has already stopped because the next chapter is going to go somewhere else 
So you re-immerse at that point. So at this point, you're actually free to, you want to make a comment on something. The question then is, can you get away with it or not? Right. And that's up to individual readers. Whether you got away. And what you're just describing there is a very deliberate breaking of immersion that you intend a reader to experience. Yeah. But sometimes it's an unintended breaking of immersion that you think the reader's never going to realize that I've just done this. Mm. So it's a bit like, um, you know, those scenes in a film where uh, the characters are talking is, oh, I must, I must post this. Uh, you must post this letter for me. It's very, very important. And they, they put it down on the thing. Said, oh, of course I will. I'll, I'll tell Susan, you must go and get that letter. And then they leave the room. And then we, the camera lingers in the room and the letter falls off because it was placed precariously. And now we know that the letter was never sent, that we, the reader, know. You go, if it was tied to close third person, you cannot have that camera lingering there to show the reader what happened to the letter after the ca after the character has left the room. That's well, you've presented a huge challenge to me then, because then I have to move into the point of view of the letter. <laughs> All I ever wanted to do was be posted. Was fall off, yes. But yes. I don't want to be read. Yeah. But you, you can see that breaking immersion there is very, very deliberate to clue the viewer in, because I was talking about a, like a film or a television uh, sequence doing this but it clues the viewer in on important information that they will now hold that the characters are unaware of and you're then playing with the meta aspect of the, the sort of the gap theory of knowledge because now the reader is in a position of knowing more than the character and the character acting as if this letter has been posted and you're going aha but i know it hasn't <gasps> Oh, and it then builds up a different type of suspense. When are they suddenly going to realize the letter wasn't posted? Everything they have been acting on has been wrong. And now, you know, it builds suspense and tension in that way because the reader or the viewer knows something that the characters don't. So like all of these things, it's being aware of it, knowing the effect created mm. and being able to manipulate that effect. I think is far more important than you must rigidly follow this. But where you are breaking the rules of the narration simply because it's cheap and easy, that's where I, fe I feel that if the same effect could have been created by uh, taking a second pass, even at a passage, to find where the information can be worked in. You contain the information that you want the reader to have. You still transmit it to the reader, but now you've done it in a way that it is seamlessly integrated into the perspective instead of breaking the perspective for no reason other than, say, an info dump. But all of these things are very, very dependent on what the author is privileging in terms of what is important. Mm -hmm. um, so that can tell you a lot Oh, actually, I should have said, not the author, the narrator. What the narrator is privileging in terms of important. Um, but I think with, with third person, because, because of how we view cinema and how we view, view film, we automatically seem to think of third person as the most cinematic. And yet when you think of a lot of the scenes of dialogue in a film, where and it's someone speaking directly to camera, you go... And they're speaking directly to you. That's first person. Yeah. Because they've done third person is where the camera's slightly further back and you can see the characters. Mm -hmm. But cinema uses a lot of first person techniques. And so third person is not naturally more cinemagraphic than first person. Or only in the sense that it 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 allows more actors. <laughs> It, it allows cast. freer range of camera. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, that is the big strength of third person. It, um, it provides an author with a greater range and view of the world. Disadvantage, obviously, for an author then is it because you have this degree of freedom, how do you choose what is important and what isn't important? Yeah, and, uh, it also allows for 
if you're holding oh we haven't even gotten into this stuff uh the extent to which a point of view controls uh your addiction levels um and the extent to which your point of view um dictates certain structure sentence length um education level uh, all of these things uh by writing a very close third person point of view you are then invited to fall into the voice of that of that character and one of the advantages to that is you can run the full range if you have enough characters um and explore all these different voices which in turn uh, gives some, some some variety to the you know think of um the road uh Cormac McCarthy try to think of that as a 950 page novel right you would <laughs> I mean as far as I can recall there is no internal internalization of that point of, uh, that third person point of view at all um so it's strict third person uh surface uh point of view um so we're simply we are the the objective the objective camera following this this one character and, and his child or is it the child's point of view no well maybe it is maybe it is actually because the child survives and then spoilers um <laughs> I don't think you could sustain that through 900 pages or 800 pages. I think it would just stylistically, it would grind the reader into dust. Uh, that's just a, a thought. And the reason, I mean, I think one of the reasons why the fantasy genre and science fiction, especially the big ones, um, can, can sustain a reader's interest is that variety of voice that you can use from multiple third person points of view yeah and even even for shorter novels um switching it's uh, kevin hearn's iron druid i think the the different point of view characters are written from different narrative perspectives so one is in first person one is in third person and it gives each chapter or each point of view then something very very clear and distinct that sets it apart Mm. from the others but of course the the other thing that you mentioned there was focalization the um the extent to which the character perspective is going to shape exposition mm -hmm. outside of the the character so uh, when a character sees something whether it is objectively described or subjectively described how close to that perspective are you going to have as a narrator and that is a great way depending on the level of focalization that you want to flavor your text to color your text to apply a lens to your text to shape it and then other people go no i don't want the character shaping that i want the descriptions and the exposition and everything that's happening i want that to be very very clear to the uh, to the reader with no interference from the character perspective so that the reader is sort of aware of an objective reality and then yeah. the character perspective yeah is... and, and yeah absolutely the that's the one huge advantage to third person point of view is that you are putting that distinction between narrator and character and you can stretch that as, as broad as you want um you don't have to go into anybody's heads you can be looking this at all of this you know as a camera on high uh, looking down on all these characters you can be looking up at all these characters you can be looking across the room and never get closer um and that was a very common style with a lot of um, american uh, literature in the uh, 20th, 20th century especially um it was quote objective it was, it was clinicals detached and the language um was very much journalistic in, in its approach um and it becomes a style in and of itself. And I would say uh, McCarthy took it to the nth, to, nth level. Um, and, 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 that, and that's clearly uh, became his obsession. I think by the time the road was written. Um, I mean, I, I found it completely unpalatable. I, 
I did not, I did not enjoy reading that experience. But maybe, maybe that's because I, I had it, you know, overwhelming me in in Iowa when I was there because everybody wanted to write that style, and I was, you know, by that point not really interested in that style anymore. So, but it is, it is what third person can allow. It can allow that really. Um, we used to call windexed uh, language um, and style is being used. That's entirely see-through. Um, it's not meant to draw attention to itself, uh, word by word. So it, it's supposed to just be the thing you look through in order to get to the story and the characters. And third person can do that extremely well. Third, per uh, first person can't, in a sense. Although characters can go very big on psychic distance within their internal monologues if they detach themselves uh, to some extent. Yeah, but even with, with first person, you can create a distinction between uh, the, what is being described. You don't have to be fully immersed, even in a first person narrative, you don't have to be fully immersed in their perspective and how they would describe it. You can no. still drop in. Like those, those descriptions can still be objective descriptions. And it's only then um, the character's actions and the character's thoughts and the limit of what the character can experience. That's what you're using first person for. Yeah. And that's, it, that's what I think is one of the big elements of this. It's not that any one style is, this style is this, and this is what it is used for. It, these are tools that have pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses that can be used to create different effects. And even when you think of something like uh, the, that transparent Windex style, you can use that in different types of narration. That's, that's fine. Yeah. You can use incredibly focalized, very uh, closely focalized uh, narration where a character who is academic, that the description suddenly in that passage will be much more mm -hmm. academic sounding because the, the perspective is academic or the character is a brutal warrior. And so you actually shape the sentences become shorter more brutal and uh, more focused on that aspect the mm. the character is actually changing and coloring and texturing the text and having texture to narration is not necessarily a bad thing just as it being transparent is not necessarily a good or bad thing it all has to style. do it's just a style yeah i mean one of the great things with a lot of the noir um, first person detective uh, approaches um, Chandler and company is the fact that yes, uh, if it's a first person, it doesn't mean the first person narration has to give you everything. And so even the first person is holding back, holding back on the reader. And that adds a whole, whole other level to, to, to how you treat um, or how you're going to treat the particular point of view you're using. It does not mean you have to spill all the beans, right? Um, first person or third person on, omniscient either. It doesn't mean you have to spill all the beans. And um, curiously, you know, you know, when we were talking about this some time ago, we were talking about coming up with some narrative examples when thinking about prose. And you recall that I was mentioning, or I mentioned the names, the Lillos, um, but I also mentioned Mrs. Dalloway. As stream of consciousness uh, writing. And what has Philip Chase just talked about? He talked about one of his favorite books was Mrs. Dalloway. There's weird synchronicity going on here. Yeah, and that's, well, I suppose it, it happens all the time that a lot of us have, a lot of us have books that the reason they stand out in our memory is because they are Great memorable books. books, that they do something that is either the first time we saw it or it is the best example we can think of for it. Um. Like, I still think of my go-to example for first-person present tense narration is the short timers. Yeah, yeah. Um, because that. That's I, the but but you don't get into Joker's head at all. No, I don't think. No. It, it's very external. Yeah, very. Uh, because a lot, of, it's very reportage. It's yeah. the embedded journalist on the ground relaying the experience of what is happening, not their personal experience. 
I think what it is is um, it's a structural reflection of the dehumanization of the training that Marines undergo. It's a perfect reflection of that. It's just here are the facts, and that's all we're going to get. And you know, nothing, nothing's going on behind the eyes that you can see. <laughs> it, it's yeah, and I think Cooper caught that at least. It's one of the things he caught in Full, full Metal Jacket. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's an interesting adaptation because obviously, yeah. uh, on the one hand, there are elements that are pitch perfect when they come across. On the other hand, he had a different message yeah. with the film than was communicated in the book. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so we, I think we've, we've pretty successfully talked around the different narrative perspectives, whether or not anyone finds this useful. <laughs> That's the problem. It's uh, it's so hard to separate these things out without starting to recognize that there are so many other elements in narrative structure built into these things. Yeah, well, at least we we tried to pinpoint strengths and weaknesses of them, what they are, what they are, what they can do, um, and then you know maybe uh, we can have another chat sometime about an, another different element of of narrative of writing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty, there's plenty to talk about. Uh, I, maybe you know, exposition versus dialogue. I mean, the two main things of, of storytelling. You don't have anything else. It's those two. That's it. Those are your choices. Okay. Well, Steve, thank you very much for, for joining me and, and uh, having this chat with me. That was good fun. Um, and for those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.